In this video, I'll be talking about the graph view. The graph view is the main and most important view of Substance Designer. It sits right in the middle here. And this is where you build your graphs and you get the texturing magic to happen. I'll be running through how to place, delete, and manage your nodes, how to navigate the view. I'll also teach you how to optimize and clean up and organize your graphs, as well as a few extra hotkeys and shortcuts that you might not know about. I've got an empty graph in front of me right now, so let's get started adding some nodes here. There are five different methods to create nodes in your graph. We'll be placing mainly atomic nodes, and the atomic nodes are the basic most building blocks of Substance Designer. I'm not going to run you through all of them and what they do. I suggest you watch another video or read the documentation about this. But uh, you can see them up here. The atomic nodes are all color coded. Uh, there's uh, not so many of them, so they all have a specific color. And the easiest way is to just drag and drop from the top here. So I'll grab one of these outputs here, drop it in and place it. And immediately you can see because this graph had no outputs and I've created one, one is listed at the bottom now. So we've gone through this before in the Explorer field. So dragging and dropping from the bar at the top is method number one. The second method is you right click, you say add node, and you get that same list of the atomic nodes. And in this case, I'll pick a uniform color like so creates this little uniform color. I can change the color if I want to in the properties, more about that later. And then I can drag and drop from the connection slots. I can create a link between the input and the output to create a very simple graph that returns a solid red color at 1024. Another method that you can use is you can use the library down here. We'll talk more about the library, but if you select the atomic nodes, then you see all the same color coded atomic nodes. I can drag and drop. And one thing you can do when you drag and drop, so it works with the top bar as well, is you can hover over a link like this, drop your node on there, and automatically Substance Designer will insert your node on that connection and reconnect the two inputs and outputs of the nodes you're placing this one between. So it keeps that connection. The fourth method that you can use, and this is my favorite one, is if you use the spacebar menu. So hotkey spacebar opens up a menu, and this is almost like a shortcut to add node. It's just even better because there's a search up there. So if in this case I want uniform color, I type UN, and straight away it performs a search and returns that uniform color at the top. So I can select it like so, and it gets placed in. What's even better is that if you have a node selected, you use the spacebar menu to, for example, place another blend, it automatically connects the previously selected node with the new node that you've placed. This only works in the direction from left to right. So if I would select this node, place something behind it, the connection is not made automatically. And then there is a fifth and final method, and this is not for atomic nodes, but it does allow you to create things in your graph. It's by using the Explorer here. So I have linked in a bitmap of the leaf that we've used in a previous exercise as well. And you can drag and drop to the graph view place it like that and it places your node inside the graph as well and you can start connecting it up. This method is a bit more limited but it's the uh, the main method for placing resources as well. We'll come back to this method a bit later in our video. So far we've mainly been placing nodes. I'll show you a few methods to delete nodes. So obviously you can select a node and hit delete and it removes it. But you can also select a connection like this and delete it. So um, the links are also individually selectable. A really interesting one is that you can remove a node. So let's just insert one here quickly like this blur without breaking the connection. So if I would remove this one, delete it, it breaks the connection. But if instead I select it and hit backspace, it keeps those connections and keeps the start and the end in between the node connected as well. So that's a good way to not break your connection. Additionally, when you're messing around with these connections, a really interesting one is if you select two connections that go into two separate slots, and you press the X key, it swaps them around. So this is the same as reconnecting them each to everyone individually. So X will swap the connections around. So after adding nodes, deleting them and managing your connections, you might want to navigate around your graph a little bit. The first and easiest thing to do is you can use the middle mouse button to pan around and move your view from left to right. You can do the same thing with control and right mouse button, also pans your view up and down left to right. You can use the scroll wheel to zoom in and out. Alternatively, you can use Alt and right mouse button and drag to zoom in and out. If you ever happen to end up in a situation where your graph is out of view, 
There's a hotkey and two buttons you can use for that. The main one being this first one, the focus, focus on selection or the whole scene. So if I click that button, it brings back a focus on my selection, in this case, that link. If I have nothing selected, I'm gonna press F, hotkey F for focus. It brings the entire graph into view. Alternatively, there is also the Z hotkey, which resets the zoom level to one. So if I press Z, resets to one. So if I zoom out really far, hit Z, goes back to one. The one thing this does do is it also focuses back onto the origin or the first point of your graph where it started that one new. So um, be careful with that. You can use Z and F after each other to reset the zoom and focus on your entire graph. So far, we've been working on a pretty simple graph. I'm going to jump into a more complex one to show you some organization methods. First off, I'll repeat something from the very first video. I'll pin the persistence of this graph component, and then I'll open up this surface paint graph. And when I've pinned the last one, it creates a new tab, and I can instantly switch between these two graphs very easily. This persistence of component works for everything, but it's most useful for graphs. When you're working on two different graphs, this allows you to switch between them very quickly. It's much faster than the one to one and a half second opening time of reopening the graph every single time. Now this surface paint graph here is quite complex. You can see that it's a, a bit of a spaghetti. There's things everywhere. And this is sort of a typical for when you're really getting into substance designer, you're creating complicated graphs, become, become very hard to understand and hard to read. So I'll show you some methods to optimize this. First off, I'll zoom in on this section here and you can see all these nodes, they're not really placed nicely in a line. It's a bit harder to see. Um, so there's a few methods you can use to align these nicely. First off, make sure that the uh, Python script toolbar here is activated. It's the yellow and blue cross. And then all the way at the side here, we've got some buttons for horizontal, vertical, and grid snapping. Hotkeys for that are H, S, and V. So if I select all of these guys and I'd like to align them on the same line horizontally, I'll press hotkey H and it aligns them nicely like that. I'll do the same with these three guys, H, and then I can just show you V and V by selecting them like that. Now, if I'd like to snap them to grid, I can select all of them, click S, and they nicely snap onto uh, evenly spaced grid positions. So once I've aligned these, this is sort of a separate section of a different part of functionality of the graph. It clearly does something specific. There's a whole chain that leads to creating this black and white spots area here. Now to make your graph easier to read, there's a few graph items you can add. And the graph items are up here next to the um, atomic nodes. You have a comment, a frame, and a pin. Frame is definitely the most useful one out of them. And just to point out, you also have them in your library here under graph items. First off, for a frame, you want to make sure you select everything which you want to frame. Then you can grab the frame and drop it on an empty area. Don't drop it on a node, drop it on an empty area, and it adds a frame around everything you had selected. You can change the color, you can change the name, so we'll call this one Spot Details, like so. And this allows you to organize your graph a little bit more. So if I quickly do that for some new sections here, and I can also add the frame with the spacebar menu, set this one to green, and I can add one through the library like so Let's set that one to red you see that we get a lot more overview in our graph and i can clearly identify sections give them names and for a frame you can even add a description to it so if you type something in here i'll quickly just type description and then zoom in you see that a small text description is added at the top here now it gets obscured by nodes and it doesn't scale up when you zoom out so the name of a frame always stays the same scale so that even from a distance you can get a quick idea of what part of a graph does what then there's also the comment now the comment is a bit like the description of a frame just by itself if i drag and drop a comment it's a simple piece of text you can type as much as you want it's just free floating doesn't scale up or down it's good for adding simple little nodes and then finally, we have the navigation pin. Now for the navigation pin to be of use, you need a fairly big graph in which you want to jump around a bit. And then you need to place at least one. So I'll place three of them. Each of them, I'll place them inside these frames, like so, like that. And then if you zoom in on a section and you press F2, it jumps to the different navigation pins. So with F2, you can see that I'm cycling through all the pins that I've placed in the order that I've placed them as well. So it's good for jumping around a big graph. It keeps your zoom level as well. So F2 jumps around like that. 
Next up, I'd like to talk a little bit about the links. Now, if you zoom out a little bit, you can see that the links, connections, wires, they have different colors and they have different thicknesses. There's gray ones and there's orange ones as well as thick ones and thin ones. So if you zoom in, for example, here on this normal map, you'll see a gray one coming in and an orange one coming out. So gray wires represent luminance or grayscale information going through and orange wires represent color or RGB, RGBA information coming out. So a normal map takes in a grayscale height map and returns a color RGB normal map that comes out of it. So from the colors, you can tell what uh, information you're working in exactly. Now you'll notice as well that in my graph, I try to here start with grayscale and then move to color more and more towards the end. The reason for this is uh, the grayscale is a bit faster, easier to work with, and just in general makes it uh, a little bit simpler to build up your graph. I try to move to color later during the process. Now you can run into some problems. I'll do a little uh, example here. If I have a blend and in this blend, I will plug in a uniform color. So let's set that to color, for example. I'll pick this bitmap of the leaf alpha and I'll set the bitmap to be grayscale. If I then connect that to the blend, I get a dotted red line. So this is a third type of line you can get, which actually signifies an error. A blend node cannot blend color and luminance information or grayscale information. They need to be both of the same type. So either you convert your color to grayscale or you convert your grayscale to color. So to do one, I would simply select the wire here. I'll hit the spacebar menu and place a grayscale conversion. And you see that the red dotted line disappears because I've converted and I've uh, moved it away. So what you can also do in that case, and this is a little extra thing, these nodes, sometimes they appear like this even, they can be docked into the uh, connection here. If I select a node, hit the hotkey D, it minimizes and pops into this little connection slot. So to sort of create a smaller version of it. If I select a note again and hit D, it pops it out and it disappears again. And you can chain these together. So I can hit D for that one, D for this one, and you can make these really minimized connections with smaller versions of the nodes. Select both of them, hit D, and they pop out again to their original position. If you want to do the invert, where you want to convert grayscale to color, there's not a color conversion node, but the gradient map takes care of that. So the first node here, there you go, converts a grayscale to a color. And again, you can pop it in with D. So I'll get rid of these and we'll move on. One other thing to point out as well is, I've mentioned this, the thick and the thin wires that we're seeing here. So you can tell here, some of these gray wires are thin, some of them are thick. And the key is in this little L8 or L16 little note that sits at the bottom. This is 8-bit lower precision color, and this is 16-bit higher precision grayscale. So um, they, it's just a, a matter of representing the bit depth or the precision of the data that's coming through. So thin wires mostly means 8-bit, thick wires means 16 or even 32-bit that you're seeing here. And there's a last thing to point out when it comes to these links. First of all, these are smooth curve type links. You might have seen or you might prefer to have rectangular links. There's a button up here, two away from the Python button, which looks like a little uh, cornered link. If I press that, it switches all links to more rectangular, artificial 90 degree bends. So you can use this type as well. You can switch back by just hitting the button again. I prefer the uh, round smoothed links, so I'll keep it at that. And what you might also want to do is rewire these links, like put them in a different position. Some of them might be crossing over other wires. For example, we've got this guy over here, which is just running through all the rest, and it's hard to tell where it's going exactly. If you hold down Alt-Shift, you actually get to see a, um, a mode in which you can take the center of a link and you can move it around. Now, in this case, it's obscured by a node. We'll move it around a bit. Alt-Shift, and I can drag this away and move it around so that I can rewire my node. And it adds a little handle that you can use to position this around and to get a clear line and to see where something is going exactly. So that helps me to organize things a bit more. And every time I do Alt Shift, it halves the line and adds one exactly in the middle. So I can actually add uh, multiple ones to a single line. So for example, this one to add it up there. You can just keep going like that. Once you add multiple ones for a smooth line, the corners do tend to get a little bit harder. And then finally, the last thing I'd like to show you is the material type of connection. So for that, I'm going to open up a new graph, the material graph here, which is created along the PBR preset. And it's got these five outputs for base color, roughness, metallic, normal, height. And I'll show you two things. You can take an existing graph like this surface paint and you can drag that into another graph. So you can't drop a graph into itself, but any graph that you're creating is already a node by itself. So when you're creating a graph, you're already building a node by yourself. You can just drop it into another graph. Once you get the hang of that, it's very powerful. 
And with this, let me switch the type again up here. You have a uh, drop down here next to the Python and the rectangular link button, where you can choose standard material or compact material. Default, it'll be at standard. And you can tell by these connections, there's a little darker connection between them. There's like a, an outline around them for a darker section. This means that they are grouped and they represent a single material. So you see base color, normal roughness, metallic height. This is outputting one single material. You can switch display modes, and this also affects how you connect things with the drop down up here. So we've got standard, material, and compact. And the hotkeys for that are one for standard, two for material, and three for compact material. So, and if you go to three, you'll see it simplifies. I'll drop in another node that supports this. All of the nodes from the material filters do. More about that in later videos. And you can drag and drop a connection then and you see that there's a green line between them. And this green line represents a full material. If I press the hotkey two again to go back into material mode, you see that it's all of the connections at the same time. So in mode two, if I pick them up, it picks up all of them at the same time. And if I go to the outputs, it even automatically connects the ones that have the same label to the appropriately marked outputs. So one for picking up single connections, so a single one, two for picking all from a group at once, and three for representing a group as a single connection. And same thing here, it works as well. It'll nicely split the wire automatically to the properly labeled outputs at the end. So remember that one, two, three to switch between these outputs and uh, connection methods. That's it for this video. Hope you've learned something. See you in the next one.